Hello, everyone. My name is Nashika Gail, and I'm the managing director of Little Zabihot Fish Farm. And today I will be presenting aquaculture in Jamaica. Just a brief overview of what I'll be talking about today. We'll talk about aquaculture in Jamaica. I'll introduce you to my farm, Little Zabihot Fish Farm, talk about a bit of the challenges faced by us farmers. We talk a bit about biosecurity and then we have our closing remarks. Now Jamaica is a small island developing state and as such we rely heavily on our marine fisheries, especially our fin fish for our source of protein. However, with the overfish status of Jamaica's marine resources and the high associated costs, there have been an increase in the demand for tilapia. It's actually one of those subsectors have seen growth despite the challenges brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. So much so that the number of farmers actually had increased from 72 active farmers during 2019, 2020 to 101 active farmers by the end of 2021. The government realized this and actually have allocated funds for the improvement of the government hat rate in order to meet that growing demand for the sector. All tilapia is consumed locally and there is no surplus production for the export market. Now, most of our farms are located on the south coast of Jamaica, in the area of St. Catherine, Clarendon and St. Elizabeth. Most of our farms, they range from as small as one acre to 300 acres. Mustard seed farm, as shown on the top of your screen, is actually one of our smaller farms measuring approximately one acre. Now the water source for these farms is predominantly from National Irrigation Commission, which is irrigation water for agricultural use. The energy for these farms is mainly supplied by the local grid. We are, are farms with alternative energy is hardly found. Most of our farms operate semi-intensively and they produce the red hybrid tilapia in large earthen clay ponds, such as the one in the picture. And the strains that are popularly seen are sterling red, the Taiwanese red, Oreochromis niloticus, and the Rocky Mountain white. So here are pictures of a few of the fishes that are found on the farm. We have the niloticus, uh, sterling red, and bottom of the screen, this is found on Longville Park Farm, is a crossbreed between rocky white and a Taiwanese red. We can talk more about that later. Now, most of our farms rely on the government's hatchery for their supply of the seed stock. However, this hatchery is unable to meet the demand. As such, our larger farmers, they have their own hatchery. Longville Park Farms, they have a nice sophisticated hatchery with vats, while Aqua Wilson Farm is a bit more low key with user hoppers. We, all, we actually have five private hatcheries, but not all hatcheries sell to the farmers. These hatcheries use a hormone-based feed, use uh, methyl testosterone with fish meal, which gives an end product between 95 to 98% meal advanced fry. But this hormone can be difficult to source because only one company in Jamaica actually has the license to import it. The popular strain used in, is, in these arteries is a Taiwanese red and the sterling red. Now, one of the largest hatcheries in Jamaica and, and is on the largest farm in Jamaica. It's located in the western parts of Jamaica. It's called Denkon, Denkon Aquaculture, also known as Algis Jamaica Limited. This farm sits on a 300 acre property and has over 110 pond acres. However, not all ponds are in use at the moment. The largest farm in Jamaica is actually run by a beautiful lady called Miss Patsy Williams. This farm produces both their fry and whole fish. On a year, during, on a monthly basis, it's 600,000 fry produced per month and approximately 31,000 tons of fish is produced, whole fish produced and sold at the property. With regards to tilapia feed, we use the tilapia pellets or we use crumble. It's a locally made feed and it, however, the problem is that it has a low protein content, 28% to be precise. 
the local feed is very expensive. It works out to be approximately 18 US dollars for one bag as seen, in, as seen on the picture. And um, it can be sold via retail in the bags or they can be trucked to each farm. The larger farms have storage units that can take, that store the feed. However, some farmers, to be exact, two farms actually import their feed. Um, they import the brand called Ziegler and it's preferred to its high protein content and its ability to float, or it's, it's more of a slow sinking feed. Uh, the protein content is approximately 50% and it actually gives the, the fish of their experience a faster growth rate using this feed. So I'm just showing you uh, one of our main areas that have a lot of fish farms. This, is, this area is called Hill Run. And within this area, there's approximately 29 farms. Um, as you can see, it's very close. Um, at the bottom of the screen, there is a scale bar of one kilometer. And from this area, there's 189, 86, sorry, tons of tilapia were produced just last year from January to September. The farms are very in size and as well as the ponds, as you can see, they also vary in size. Now, in how they market the tilapia. Most farmers sell the fish whole and un un unprocessed. They sell it to wholesalers, also known as, also known as higglers in Jamaica. Um, the market size ranges from about 280 grams to about 450 grams. And this is sold for approximately $5 US per kilogram. The red hybrid is actually preferred over the black because a lot of Jamaicans have it that it's, it's a better taste in fish which is it's just based on aesthetics rather than, than taste. The market peak is usually in Easter when there's a lot of fish um, being eaten. Also, it's also surrounded around major holidays when there are large gatherings as well. However, there is one man, my dad, that likes to think outside of the box. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Mr. Little. He's not, so, he's not quite little, but that's his name, Mr. Little. Now, Mr. Little loves fishing, he loves being outdoors. And when we were small, he would carry us to, out to the sea to catch fish with our, his hook and line. However, over the years, that essentially couldn't happen anymore because there's literally no fish in the sea. So he, he got quite sad. So he said, hey, why not? Let me just try buy a farm. So he went ahead and bought a 20 acre property in 1996. He only started out with one building and about six ponds. From then he would go down and relax. He visited the farm every day, wind down after a busy week. And he always invited his friends and family and just liked to cook and drink and just have a good time. But this actually gave him a great idea. What if people like himself were just disconnected, they were stressed, and he realized this, that along with the fact that there's a lack of recreational spaces that give a holistic experience with food, with animals and with the environment. And this can actually lead a negative impact on the health and wellness of individuals, quality family time and team building experiences. He came up with a solution. Why not promote sustainable sustainable fishing for relaxation and family time. We already have a fish farm, why not? Let's also add in the importance of env environmental sustainability and awareness. There's not much fish in the sea. Let's not put any more pressure on it. We can use, we can have fish sustainably at our farm. And here what, eat what we grow and grow what we eat. And why can't this be affordable? And there, ladies and gentlemen, he created Little's Hobby Hut Fish Farm, a recreational fishing facility that is open to the public to come and relax and wind down, have some fun and eat some good food. He created the ultimate fishing experience. Now, due to the location of the farm, we're actually close to the sea. So we get an influx of salt water. So the water at the farm is actually brackish. As such, we are able to grow snook, tarpon, and we also have paku or colosuma species along with our tilapia. This actually created excitement with our customers as they're able to just fish and they, when they catch a big fish, they're so excited. 
So it, it gave him a great feeling of accomplishment. Regardless of age, regardless of size, regard, regardless of experience, the customers are taught how to fish and how to handle their catch. We then take it and cook it and prepare any, any style that they would want. Well, at this time, I did not have a measuring tool, but why not use the most universal measuring tool there is, a bear bottle, whichever bear you like. So we have our red stripe Hanneken and our red stripe light. As you can see, the size of our fish that at the farm, they can get pretty big. Now, this gave a, this gave a lot of persons a good feeling because they're able to spend the time with their family. They had, there was father-son bonding time, mommy and, mommy and me bonding time. We had birthday parties. We even hosted university, the university volleyball team. So it was a good bonding experience for everyone. And not to mention, my dad taught the chef, the experienced chef, how to cook his way. So we provided fish, whether steam, so steam fish, we had tilapia with chayote, or, or we call it chocho, okra, we put carrot, pumpkin, and a Jamaican favorite, uh, this is called water crackers, it's awesome. I yeah, wish you could try it. We have our homemade curry fish with the tilapia as well, and our popular escovitch fish, which is essentially fried fish, with an escovit sauce where you have in that sauce is scotch bonnet pepper. It wouldn't taste the same with any other pepper. There's carrots, there's onions, and there's vinegar. To taste it is to love it. It's perfect. So our customers actually said we have one of the best tasting tilapias out there as it has no muddy or earthy aftertaste. So we created an eco-friendly experience. There's enough space on our farm to unwind and watch the dancing coconut trees. It's actually the only farm in Jamaica that offers fishing and it's the only farm with the, we call it saltwater tilapia. Since the salt, the tilapia is grown in brackish water. And it's the only farm that gives that authentic outdoor experience. You, there's no building inside, so there's no internet. You can get cell service, but you are, you're forced to just relax. And from an early age, I realized farming is the future. Farming is the way forward. And in 2011, I started as the manager at the farm while doing my master's and then doctoral studies in marine biology. In 2020, our business was selected to participate in the Blue Economy Program through the Branson Center for Entrepreneurship. During this program, I learned a lot about strategizing, I learned about branding, marketing, growth strategy, business models. And when I was up ready and ready to apply all what I've learned, COVID hit. But that didn't stop us. We actually re-strategized and hit the road to recovery. We offered a farm to plate experience. So what we would do, we would take orders, whether for fish, raw or cooked, and we had produce on the farm. So so we packaged everything, take our orders and delivered it to persons who were unable to come out. So currently we're in the process of remodeling our infrastructure to accommodate persons while maintaining social distancing. And we're also modernizing and try to implement more remotely operated technology such as a point of sale system and our cameras. Farmers alike, we all experience all these similar challenges. One of which, as I mentioned before, is the constant supply of advanced fryer from the hatchery due to the shortage. This is more of a maintenance or the hatchery needs to be improved in infrastructure wise and hopefully in the future, this will be alleviated. The next is the increasing cost of fuel and energy. Whether you have electric pumps or gas pumps, the cost of energy, energy in Jamaica is, is really high and it is really affecting not only the fishing industry, but also the food sector as well. Cradial larceny. Well, it, it, it's hard. It's hard as a farmer when your, your stock is almost ready and the night before somebody can come and just literally half your pond. It, it's rough on farmers and, and we're trying our best to put things in place to, to reduce this, but it, it, it's, it's hard. As I mentioned before as well, another challenge is our feed. Both the quality of the local feed and the cost is actually challenging in terms of we're not getting a good growth rate. And if we plan to import the feed, there's a high VAT or a high import tax on it. 
and climate change. My farm experienced this a couple of years ago in 2015 when there was actually a drought. Um, it was actually mentioned in the papers where uh, the drought affected us so much, the ponds were, since it's clay, it was actually cracking and water was literally leaking out of the ponds. Uh, we had to reduce the number of ponds to about four at the time from 10, based on the amount of water that we had available. And the wider local acceptance of tilapia. Well, not much Jamaica. As I said, yes, we do have a demand for tilapia, but it can be more. Um, a lot of Jamaicans, they, they are more accepting towards our marine counterpart. But if we can promote tilapia better or have a better program for it, I think we'll, we will have a boom in the market. And also biosecurity. Now, let's talk a little bit about biosecurity. When we think about biosecurity, we think about quality assurance systems, uh, isolation with regards to the location of your farm, the traffic coming on and off the farm, uh, pest management, and if we have other livestock available on the farm. Good hygiene of our workers and em the employees and managers as well, and also healthcare and monitoring of your stock. What I have observed on, on my farm, as well as when I did a survey of all the farms, oh, sorry, and good management practices, is that there is no tangible quality assurance system manual in place for these farms. Some, although some farms are isolated like my farm, some are also close together as you can see as the one in Hill Run. One bird can literally visit each farm in one day in that area. With farms that have restricted access to visitors, with regards to my farm, visitors are only allowed on one section of the farm that's it's fenced off. They are not allowed beyond that point. And we only use, they're only, they're only able to access two ponds and that's where we put our grout fish. Um, we select the size and in those ponds and essentially they're only, they're only able to take those, those fish. They are not, they won't have any access to our small fish or our nursery pond. The animal vectors that I've seen on farms and my farm is rodents, cats, and dogs. Um, they're, dogs essentially are our security system more or less, but they're not allowed within the buildings. There are pest management put in place for these farms. And the animal predators that we see is predominantly birds and crocodiles, um, but there are preventative measures usually put in place for birds. With regards to crocodiles, they're protected. So we would have to call a government agency and they would come and remove the crocodiles and relocate them. But one thing that is concerning is that some farmers actually share their nets. So the good thing is that we actually have support from the Jamaican government. We, the Agriculture Division of the Ministry of Agriculture provides support through extension officers that actually monitor and evaluate the operations at each farm on a monthly basis. We also have members from RADA, which is another extension arm of the Agriculture Ministry, and they provide a technical support for farmers as well. With regard to healthcare packages, uh, the Sajikor Bank provided recently through our minister, um, Floyd Green, a uh, Sajikor Agricare program that gives farmers a proper health insurance package. And we also get grants in the form of feed or fry provided to the farmers that are affected severely by natural disasters or negative impacts of the COVID pandemic. However, there's no specific benefit for women farmers that I know of, but there are benefits for women in business. So in closing, as you can see, there is room for growth in Jamaica's industry. We just need to like tidy up a bit of the things that we are doing here. Uh, but we do need proper sensitization and outreach programs needed to boost local consumption, and then we can consider the export markets. Also, we need more funds to be allocated in ensuring the sustainability of the industry in terms of modernizing the government infrastructure that's there. Value added product, we can transform. Jamaicans are creative people and we can transform or products. More income can be earned if tilapia is processed before market, whether it be filleted or let's let's have jerk tilapia, why not? And tilapia farming can be transferred into a viable business based on tourism, whether local, international, as seen from my farm. 
And why not invest in educating farmers more about biosecurity? Well, thank you for sitting and having patience with me and my presentation. I do hope you enjoyed it and I'm open for questions now. <laughs>